And so you have to think about the motion moving up and down between those limiting positions. Now I'd like to compare our answer with classical theory. Here's the general expression for the eigenvalue. It's really a, a definition. I'll carry a subscript i on it as well as on the natural frequency so that it can either be the first or second uh, eigenvalue. Rho is the density of the material of the beam. A is a cross-sectional area. L is a little bit of a trick that it was the length of our finite element, which is really only half the beam length. So uh, as I move into the comparison with theory, I need to change over to a length that's the full beam length, L tilde. E and I are the Young's modulus and then the moment of inertia of the beam about its uh, uh, neutral axis. Now we found these uh, non-dimensional numerical numbers here that are uh, represent the this frequency, so-called frequency ratio that I've been calling it. Uh, and we can recover specific frequencies out of this or even leave it in symbolic form, which uh, can occur by putting this lambda in here. And when you do that, and if you bring that square root of lambda out, uh, you get what uh, Thompson calls a K value by proper, uh, properly handling this. And you found that our finite element number here uh, corresponds to this number that's a textbook classical value, and we're only 1% different. On the other hand, the second eigenvalue is substantially higher than the textbook value by 33%, roughly. So, according to Rayleigh's original idea, by carrying uh, these two active degrees of freedom in the interior of the beam, we seem to have gotten, in this case, one answer to within engineering accuracy and one not. But I think the question of how you handle, in that approximate idea, the end degrees of freedom is not clear. So I tried not to emphasize this rule as a, as a hard and fast rule, but kind of a, an engineering aid. Let's discuss our results. It will turn out that the mass and stiffness matrices that we've used are nice ones, and that our answers give eigenvectors that are orthogonal in a certain sense. Now, it's not in the common Euclidean sense that they are perpendicular to each other necessarily in general, but rather that they are orthogonal with respect to the mass and the stiffness matrices. So. This result shown here is a general result that would happen in um, all such vi vibration problems that are of this normal mode type with no damping and with nice mass and stiffness properties. Uh, the fact that you could take one of the eigenvectors and pre-multiply the mass matrix and then post-multiply by the other eigenvector in our problem, and this time this triple product is really a scalar triple product and gives you literally the number zero, uh, provided you use different eigenvectors, then this is orthogonality with respect to the mass matrix. The same thing happens here with respect to the stiffness matrix. You pre and post multiply in that triple product, you get the number zero. And, and this is general. This will happen in uh, a broad range of so-called self-adjoint eigenvalue problems where you get nice eigenvectors. Now notice this is a condition on the shape in which the uh, the problem must vibrate. So in our case, it was a cantilever beam. And basically it says that the two vibration modes that we have found are as different as possible from each other. We can check whether it holds in our case by just substituting our answers. Here was our um, phi 1 was a translational uh, degree of freedom at that center node, um, and this was the first mode. On the other hand, phi 2 was this one here, was the second mode um, with a rotation at the center node. The mass matrix that we were able to um, uh, simplify was the, the identity matrix. You multiply those two, well, what I'm saying here is you first multiply these two to give the second vector, and then you pre-multiply and get the zero quantity. So that checks this orthogonality with respect to the mass matrix. Now the 
Uh, second condition on stiffness also holds. These numbers are not quite as obvious now. You do the multiplication on the back two, and you get zero and 420. But in the, this case, because of the special nature of our uncoupled problem, this easily comes out to be zero. So we have proven that there is orthogonality with respect to the stiffness matrix. In addition to the orthogonality that we just discussed, there's another kind of handling of the vectors that's important, and that's called the creation of orthonormal modes. Now this is a scaling of the modes such that they have a certain prescribed inertia content. And it's done in reference to this equation where you have a triple scalar product with the mass weighting. And so by putting the same eigenvector in the first location and in the third, you're getting an idea of the size of this vector phi as um, modified by the inertia of the system. Now if you pick that to equal one when you put the same vector on either side, then you get this uh, option over here. We already showed that in general you do get a zero. Uh, in other words, the modes are orthogonal with respect to the mass matrix when you put different modes in these two sides. So they're orthogonal uh, to each other. So now what we're talking about now though is normalizing the vector phi and using a different scale factor than the one that we used previously where we had a maximum unit value in any of the coordinates. So this kind of normalization leads to so-called orthonormal modes. The notation's a little tricky because now the orthogonal part comes under ortho and this normal means normalized size uh, with respect to these inertial properties. Now it will turn out that we have gotten this kind of normalization um, uh, in, in the sense of scaling of the vector automatically just due to luck and that the two kinds of scaling of the vector, e either using a maximum size of one or doing this mass normalization, give the same answer here. So here's our first eigenvector on both sides. You multiply that out. Typically I do the uh, second multiplication first, uh, giving this vector, and then that comes out unity. Likewise with the second uh, mode shape, with the scaling that we had picked for other reasons, zero, one, in fact, uh, you do the multiplication, you come out with unity again. So the conclusion is that our modes are orthonormal and we just locked out because of the uh, scaling way that we scaled the vector with unit maximum size uh, also gives you the mass property that we desired. Often it's important to get an estimate of the dominant eigenvalue in a problem. This can be done by a method called Rayleigh's quotient. It starts out with the general eigenvalue problem in this form and usually the physical problem determines the matrix A and B. Then if we presume that we can guess the shape in which the body vibrates, we can put that in as an approximate known quantity. That leads to a set of n equations here below uh, which have really only one unknown, namely the eigenvalue estimate. So one way to convert this into a single equation in the unknown is to pre-multiply by the vector itself. I've heard some people call this a Galerkin approach. The effect of pre-multiplying by the displacement vector means that you're changing a force balance into an energy balance. Here's the resulting equation and you get these uh, quadratic forms uh, on the left and right side. These, uh, these become what I'm 
often calling a matrix triple product here. It's a number, and this one here is a number. So when you solve for lambda, you really have the ratio of two numbers. And basically, this is a ratio of, of the uh, stiffness uh, energy or the strain energy in this system compared to the kinetic energy. This is a way that is used to get an estimate for the fundamental frequency in a structure. And you need to be able to predict then the shape of that fundamental mode. That's not too hard on something like a cantilever beam. And the, the Rayleigh quotient will come moderately close to giving the eigenvalue in that case. Now, the special eigenvalue problem that we also discussed is just missing this uh, matrix here, the B matrix, and so the Rayleigh's quotient just simplifies a bit. Often, because this is most accurate when it's used in uh, studying the first mode, it is understood that the Rayleigh's uh, quotient will be used for the fundamental mode. A matrix um, consists of many terms, and sometimes it's difficult to tell something about the good behavior of that matrix. Many things like strain energy, kinetic energy, have to be positive. And so the real question is, would that matrix in question cause physically realizable quantities? For that reason, the term positive definite has been invented to cover a situation where this triple product formed here is always greater than zero for any trial vector x. If this were, for instance, a strain energy calculation, A would be the stiffness matrix and x would be the displacement field. And the question would be, would you get positive strain energy for every conceivable displacement of the body? If this were a mass matrix, then x might be the velocity field, and the same thing would come up with kinetic energy. The fact that this is strictly greater than zero means that you cannot get zero energies. That has quite a, an impact on rigid body motion, which is uh, of a second category. If you had a system that had rigid body modes in it, then you would say that the stiffness matrix were positive semi-definite, as shown here. This means that there could be some displacement fields that would create no strain energy. For mathematical completeness, people often define negative definite and negative semi-definite. This is kind of academic because it's more common than to put a minus sign on the matrix and, and discuss it in terms of positive definiteness and semi-definiteness. In structural vibrations and in physics, uh, in various fields there has developed a notation that's somewhat universal. The eigenvalues themselves are often aligned as along the real number line if they're real eigenvalues and, and they are called the spectrum of eigenvalues for the system. So if someone speaks of spectrum, you have the idea of all these eigenvalues side by side. Of course, this is true in physics with the, the color spectrum found by um, uh, shining white light through a prism. The eigenvectors themselves can be lined up in a similar way, and normally you would associate one of those with each of the eigenvalues in the spectrum. Sometimes the symbols are grouped in, in a matrix form to help on some uh, operation. And this lambda here is a diagonal matrix, often with a capital lambda, made up from the individual eigenvalues arraigned down the main diagonal. The modal matrix here is often written in column form with the first, second, and so on lined within as shown. I've seen authors try to do that row-wise, and it causes all kinds of problems because the world pretty much is oriented column-wise on such displays. Also, the way that computers work, they often treat 
variables in a columnized fashion. So you can slow down a numerical process depending how you do your uh, matrix multiplications if you're not careful. Our first problem in the problem session is going to be a system that I've simplified until the point where it's a single degree of freedom system. The question is whether you can find the first natural frequency for a beam of length L that's clamped at the left end and is guided at the right end. This is a roller skate condition where the slope is not allowed to change. In other words, this body will vibrate up to this position and then down to this position where the slope is zero at the wall on the right. We're only going to use one finite element in our solution of this problem, just as an academic solution, and it will let us get a quick measure on the first mode of the system. Even though we start out with four degrees of freedom, there's only one active degree of freedom that remains after we apply the boundary conditions. Here's our finite element model with two degrees of freedom at each end. This is treated as an Euler-Bernoulli beam. I'm not interested in axial motion, nor torsional, nor out-of-plane flexure. So there are the two degrees of freedom at each end of the beam. Now the clamp at the left will knock out the first and second degrees of freedom, and the guided condition on the right will knock out the rotation U4. If you assemble a single beam element then, you get these matrices, the mass and the stiffness matrices. The red lines show the columns that are crossed out because it's a trivial multiplication. That would reduce this set of equations to a set with rectangular matrices, actually a um, matrix that only needed terms here that are uh, four rows uh, times one column, and then the only unknown being U3. This would give you um, four equations and four unknowns, and then you would want to partition out the first, second, and fourth equations and set them aside to find reactions later. The third equation can be uncoupled and solved for the unknown displacement amplitude U3. So that equation is set aside here. It's currently a second order ordinary differential equation. We reduce it to an algebraic form by assuming harmonic motion in time. And that complex exponential appears again then in both terms and can be canceled. It also brings out a minus omega squared, which uh, to our uh, view is the eigenvalue in the problem. Now this could have a trivial solution of no displacement at any frequency, or it could have a non-trivial uh, displacement, but at exactly only one frequency, namely omega squared equal to this set of parameters. Notice that you bring in the uh, material properties of Young's modulus and uh, material density. Then you have the cross-sectional moment of inertia, the area of the beam, and the length of the beam. And the length appears here as well. You solve for frequency, and this is our approximate solution. Now we know that the uh, mode shape is being characterized only by four shape functions. These are cubics, and we realize that our assumed displacement field here as the limiting envelope of this pattern of vibration is not the exact one. Nevertheless, we're within 4.4% of the correct answer. Now we started out with four degrees of freedom and we constrained three of those in the boundary conditions, leaving one active degree of freedom. Now whether that makes Rayleigh happy or not, I'm not certain. We got one frequency uh, to engineering accuracy in this problem. And there's a question of whether there were really one active degree of freedom or whether all four degrees of freedom were helpful. So I think I, I'm going to beg the question on whether Rayleigh is happy or not with this particular solution. Uh, 
the number of degrees of freedom in here, I have seen uh, and, and the accuracy corresponding thereof to wander on these very small problems like this. When you get to larger problems, it's clear that you need to carry uh, at least twice as many degrees of freedom. And people usually overkill and carry many, many times more than twice the uh, number of degrees of freedom. So. Although I've mentioned Rayleigh's rule of thumb, it turns out in practice and in industry, the real problem is cutting down the size of your model size in, in finite elements and getting it down to a low enough number of degrees of freedom. <laughs> We've used the beam element for several examples of natural frequency, so our second problem will have a triangle as an example. Uh, this is a plane stress, uh, constant strain, equilateral triangle. Sometimes I call it the Turner Triangle. It's made of aluminum, it's clamped at the bottom edge, and then the question is, what are the natural frequencies of a body modeled with just one element? Now, we know that by clamping the bottom edge, we're taking out the uh, degrees of freedom normally associated with the base, and so basically we're going to have the, the tip vibrating, and there will be some question whether it moves horizontally or vertically. The description of the problem is given in detail here uh, in metric measure. I will give the... Uh, the shear modulus because it appears later on in the one kind of motion. Let's write out the equations of motion for this triangle. The general form of the equation is mass times acceleration plus stiffness times displacement equals the external force field. We're going to set that equal to zero because we want to do the eigenvalue problem. And when we do that, we get this general set of equations below. With a single element model, we have six degrees of freedom, and those degrees at the first and second nodes here are going to be set zero as shown in these terms on acceleration and these terms on displacement. As before, we can cancel out columns that are multiplied by the zeros, which gets rid of the first four columns in each matrix. And uh, then we can partition, ultimately, the first four equations out, leaving the last two equations. And the terms of interest then lie on this square block that I'm outlining. Now, I'm presuming that you can find the mass matrix for the triangle in my earlier lecture in this series, and you can find the Turner triangle stiffness in the linear static lecture series or some textbook. Uh, what you find is, interestingly, for the elastic part of the Turner triangle, when it's uh, clamped like this, that one of the stiffness terms is primarily a uh, stretching stiffness here, the EH term. The other one's primarily a shearing kind of stiffness, and those act on the five and six coordinate directions. I've picked this Turner Triangle with a little bit of malice of forethought because I know that it uncouples and you get the vertical and horizontal motion at that tip to act independently. Uh, the way we say that in mathematics is that the equations uncouple. The equation for U5, which is the horizontal motion of the tip, uh, involves the inertia term and a shearing stiffness term. Uh, that one I have plotted below here, and it's primarily the tip of the little element tipping as shown. Now, actually, it moves with straight-sided motion because the Turner Triangle is required to do that. But I've drawn it in kind of an, with artistic license here as if it were a freestanding element. Um, so, uh, in the case that we look at the uh, first equation as a non-trivial solution for U5, but set U6 to be zero, then we're going to get this mode and this frequency. Let's put in numerical values and find out what that frequency really is. And uh, for the given aluminum 
triangle, we find that the frequency is awfully high. Uh, we have here that it comes out after putting the numbers in at 14,000 hertz. So this body is relatively stiff in regard to the shearing motion. It is a thin sheet and, and sheet material is relatively stiff within its own plane. Even a piece of paper, you know, is pretty hard to stretch very much or shear, although you can bend it out of its plane rather easily. But there is reason to believe that these high frequencies are okay. Now the second eigenvalue comes from the alternate solution where uh, we take the coordinate u5 to be zero and let u6 be non-zero. And in that case, uh, we can solve directly from our uh, set of uncoupled equations to find the second natural frequency. As shown in the previous sketch, you can see that this second frequency is extensional and the tip node at the top of the triangle moves up and down. And putting in the proper physical coefficients for this sheet of aluminum, we get 24,000 hertz for that frequency. So that is certainly a stiff little triangle. Now, the single element model that we have chosen is too stiff in general because we don't give it enough freedom to really deform in a general way. The constant strain triangle was originally developed as if it were embedded in a uh, plate where there were many neighboring elements. And together they often act with straight sides. But we know that for a freestanding single element that more likely there would be some cupping of these sides as I sketched the shearing mode originally. And yet the element is not free to do that. In fact, must move uh, with straight sides. So, uh, as Rayleigh showed um, 100 years ago, when your uh, elastic model is too simple, then you constrain the ways that it can move and your frequencies are too high in general. In our third problem, I'm going to look at a pathological eigenvalue problem. Earlier I had told you that nice eigenvalue problems with n degrees of freedom have n eigenvalues and n corresponding eigenvectors. But that's not always the case, so I thought you should see the counterexample. Consider a general eigenvalue problem shown here where you have this matrix and this matrix as the given quantities. Then the question is, is there an xy vector that will bring these two um, matrix forms into balance and give a zero vector as a result? Well, we're used to solving two equations and two unknowns and thinking this happens, but no, it doesn't always happen. And uh, we're going to look at this solution and then explain it and ask, does it make any physical sense? Um, secondly, what kind of a mechanical system could this system represent? Well, while it's in front of me, I'll, I'll point to this matrix here, which would basically be a stiffness type of matrix. And uh, this is a reasonable stiffness matrix. I know from uh, things that we haven't yet discussed. The determinant of the matrix is 2 times 5, which is 10 minus 4 equaling 6, and, and that's positive, that's fine, the main diagonals are positive. This is, in fact, what is called a positive definite matrix. But over here, this matrix in the mass position is pathological. It, it has no quantity here on the main diagonal, so there's a massless coordinate, first of all. Secondly, there's an unsymmetric part here on this mass matrix, and that cannot happen in nature. So uh, this is a weird, I'm going to have to put a weird matrix problem over here. Then we'll see what happens next. When a person solves simultaneous sets of linear algebraic equations, the condition for a solution to exist when there's no right-hand force is that the determinant of the coefficients be zero. So that so-called characteristic equation is shown here. Um, 
The eigenvalue lambda would normally be associated with a frequency in such a vibration problem. Now this is a non-symmetric matrix, first of all, and that's puzzling because it's hard to get those in nature. It can happen in some problems like uh, flutter of wings, some of the non-conservative problems, however. But when I take the determinant here, you get 2 times 5 minus lambda uh, minus 2 times 2 minus lambda, and you multiply that out, and you get 6 equals 0. So unless we need to reinvent our whole system of uh, algebraic manipulations, this is impossible. And it means there is no way to cause a balance of forces such as we have proposed. So there are no eigenpairs in this problem or eigensolutions. Uh, the mass matrix is singular and it's non-physical. So the equations make no physical sense. And would there be a system that, that we could uh, even pose as a hypothetical thing, you know. Um, I don't think so because to get a non-symmetric mass matrix uh, would fall under the category of uh, what we would have for stiffnesses as a so-called circulatory stiffness. And I don't think there is such a thing as a circulatory mass. Um, who knows, maybe we'll, someone will find one someday, but we're, we are not able to find any eigenvalues and eigenvectors on this problem. Now I'd like to move from single elements up to a system and try one mechanical system uh, and search for its uh, vibrational modes. This will be tougher because there are more variables. I'm going to bring in a side issue, and that's the application of the Buckingham Pi theorem, because sometimes it's good to stand back from the problem's numerical aspects and look at the symbolic nature and see if you can understand the number of variables that have to be involved in the solution. This solution is going to uh, involve a beam, a rod, a concentrated mass, and a spring. So we're getting, we're getting pretty tough here. The concentrated mass is going to dominate uh, the other masses, and that will help us simplify the problem in the inertia matrix. We're going to ask that we find the characteristic equation uh, in the determinant form for these frequencies, and then find the frequencies. Then I want to thoroughly discuss the uh, application of the Buckingham Pi theorem to this problem and uh, show how clusters of physical terms can be bound together and simplify the problem. Here's a sketch of the system that we're discussing. There's a beam that's cantilevered from the left wall and has a point mass at its tip. There's a rod that extends from this grounded position up to the mass and a linear spring, capital K, that's grounded on the right wall. Since the point mass dominates all the other masses, we won't do any bookkeeping on the other masses. The degrees of freedom that are of interest are shown below for the uh, beam, there's a possibility of axial motion because of this mass, so we'll keep in the U1 uh, displacement component at the left end as well as U4 at the right end. Then the classical Euler-Bernoulli beam in flexure requires U2, U3, U5, and U6. The rod only acts in tension and compression and only requires U5 at one end and U7 at its base. The linear spring here only requires the um, horizontal deflection at that wall. So those are our eight degrees of freedom, and the boundary conditions are going to constrain these three at the left wall, this one at the right wall, and this one at the floor. Let me introduce some shorthand for the stiffnesses so that I don't have to carry so many symbols in our matrices. Um, K0 and K1 represent the stiffnesses of the beam at the top, and the symbol 1 means that that's our first element. Uh, this is the flexural stiffness term, and then this is the axial stiffness term. 
K2 over here represents the stiffness of the rod uh, at the bottom of the problem as our second element. And the inertia terms, when they are accounted for, will add in only due to the point mass. We're not going to worry about the beam and rod and, and spring masses. And the total mass M will act both in the U4 and in the U5 directions and appear as symbols on the main diagonal. This is a lumped mass, and there's no coupling between those two degrees of freedom, uh, thereby giving the zeros here and here. Likewise, there's no rotational effect, and so there's no mass on the coordinate U6. We'll assemble the stiffness matrix in a similar manner as we did with the mass matrix. Again, showing rows and columns that won't be of interest crossed out. The degrees of freedom U4, 5, and 6 are the surviving degrees of freedom uh, located at the tip of the cantilever beam at the mass. And you can see how the various stiffnesses add in to uh, oppose the motion of that particular node. We have uh, several stiffnesses that agglomerate together and they appear in, in this pattern. Now the first thing we'll do is reduce our original 8 by 8 set of equations to the appropriate 3 by 3. Here is the remaining stiffness matrix and mass matrix and in these coordinates that survive and there's no force uh, that's external. We'll assume harmonic motion now and let us clear out the time variable in the problem. So we'll assume that this is a standing wave sort of motion where there's a spatial part and a time part. Then by taking derivatives, we'll recover a minus omega squared here, uh, acting on a stationary part and then the complex exponential. Here now is our mass matrix, which picks up in a minus omega squared factor, and then these constant coefficients. The uh, stiffness matrix is unchanged, but has the constant terms and, again, the uh, exponential. Now, we can uh, do some non-dimensionalization here to turn this problem into a more uh, tractable form.